Okay, so hello to anybody who is watching this. My name is Dr. Erica Kelman. I am a physicist. I got my PhD at the University of California, San Diego, and I'm going to go ahead and give a presentation on my thesis research that I did at UC San Diego. And the primary purpose of this is just so that I can practice giving this presentation in preparation to give it as a job talk, but I also thought that people might like to see what I did over the course of my PhD, so that's what we're going to look at today. Let me go ahead and pull up the laser pointer so I can highlight things, and so the structure here you see in the bottom are what we're going to be talking about, because as you can see, the title is Excitons in Transition Metal <laughs> Excitons in Transition Metal Dicalcogenide Van der Waals Heterostructures. And this thing you see down here is a Van der Waals heterostructure. Oh, advance. Alright. So we're gonna give an introduction to what indirect excitons are. And then we're gonna talk about an experiment where we looked at things called trions and other things called direct excitons in van der Waals heterostructures, and then we're going to talk about what I was trying to accomplish in my thesis, which is the studying of indirect excitons in van der Waals heterostructures. So first I'd like to talk about what an indirect exciton is. So in general, an exciton is a bound pair of an electron and a hole in a semiconductor. So since this is for a general audience on the internet, if you don't know, a electron is, of course, an elementary particle which conducts electricity in item materials, but there's also something else called a hole, which is the absence of an electron, and so it's a little bit difficult to understand if you don't know anything about semiconductor physics, but for now just take my word for it that it's loosely analogous to antimatter, but instead of uh, actually creating an antiparticle out of the vacuum the way they do in a particle accelerator, we're just exciting an electron away from an atom in a semiconductor, and the absence of that electron leaves a positive charge on that atom, and that vacancy can move around, and it transports electric charge in much the same way that an electron would. But so then an exciton is when you have a electron that's put into uh, an excited state, and then you have a hole, which is deficiency of an electron, and they are electrostatically bound to each other via the Coulomb interaction, right? Opposites attract, and the electron and the hole are simply held together via the electrostatic Coulomb force. And then there's also this special thing called an indirect exciton, which we write as Ix, which are where the electron and the hole are confined to separate quantum well layers, and so that's something like what's drawn on this diagram here, where the horizontal axis is depth inside of a material, and the vertical axis represents the energy that an electron exi can exist at, at that particular depth in the material, and it's slanted because of an applied electric field. And these dips you see here are what's called quantum wells, where there's different types of materials that have different band gaps, and so as a result, the allowable energies for electrons are different in this region with one type of material than in this region with a different type. So you see here there's aluminum gallium arsenide which has a wider bound gap, and so the electron energies are higher. And then here there's regular gallium arsenide which has a smaller band gap, so the electron energies can be lower. And so that's going to tend to put the electrons and the holes into these quantum well layers. And by putting them in the same quantum well layer, the way they are on the le left here, they are what's called a direct exciton, where the electron and the hole are right next to each other. But you can create something else called an indirect exciton, which is this other oval, where the electron and the hole are kept at different positions in the material. And this has several advantages, which are the properties of indirect excitons you see over here, which First of all, all excitons, direct or indirect, are bosons, so they can th obey Bose-Einstein statistics rather than Fermi-Dirac statistics, which means that you can have more than one of them in the same place at the same time, as opposed to just 
electrons by themselves. You can only have one in the same place at the same time, and there's some trickery going on there with how you create things called composite bosons, but just be aware that they behave in according to Bose-Einstein statistics rather than Fermi-Dirac statistics, and that this is important. <laughs> so they also have long and controllable lifetimes, which this is very important because the thing about electrons and holes is, remember I said it's loosely analogous to antimatter, where the electron and the hole are going to want to recombine with each other the way matter and antimatter would. And what happens when they recombine is they turn the excitation energy that was used to kick an electron off of an atom and create a free electron and as well as create a hole in the process, that energy is then reabsorbed and turned into either a, a photon, a particle of light, or it's turned into a phonon, uh, essentially heat, inside the material, and the exciton ceases to exist. And so that happens after some finite amount of time, and indirect excitons, because the electron and hole are further apart, it's going to take them longer to recombine with each other. And by adjusting the strength of the electric field that causes this slanting of the energy diagram here, we're able to actually control that lifetime. And there's another pro important property, which is because they're what's called oriented dipoles, because all the electrons are in, in this example, the right quantum well, and the holes are all in this example in the left quantum well, that means they're all oriented in the, in the same direction, which means that they actually are going to repel each other, because anytime you get two excitons close to each other, the holes will get close to each other, and the electrons will get close to each other, and the like charges are attracted, hence the excitons being in a bound state, but, or sorry, the opposite charges are attracted, hence the excitons being in a bound state, but the like charges will repel, and so when two excitons get close to each other, they will repel one another, and that means that they are able to actually do lots of things. And that includes screening disorder because they have yet another property from being oriented dipoles, which is that the stronger the electric field, the more attracted to that location the exciton is going to be. So because they repel each other, but they're attracted to stronger electric fields. If you have an electric field that varies over the course of the material, you can use that to control transport. But also if you have a very chaotic electric field that's varying over the course of the material, you have the ability to screen out that disorder via exciton-exciton interaction. And so because they screen out disorder and they have long lifetime, that means they can travel over long distances. And then, furthermore, because they're these oriented dipoles, when you increase the strength of the electric field, you lower their energy, like I was saying, and therefore we can control their energies by just varying the strength of that electric field by varying gate electrodes. And here you see exciton energy versus gate voltage. So you see up here we call the direct regime where you're making direct excitons and the electric field doesn't have much of an effect on the energy and at some point it crosses over to where the electric field is strong enough to force the electrons into one well and the holes into the other and then you get this linear relationship between energy and gate voltage and finally i'll mention there are also these type 2 structures where up here you see a symmetric structure where the barrier is aluminum gallium arsenide and the quantum wells are both made of gallium arsenide. But you can also have an asymmetric structure where you have one quantum well made of gallium arsenide and the other quantum well made of aluminum arsenide. And this will create a built-in electric field so that you create indirect excitons even with zero applied electric field or zero gate voltage. Okay, so this is some more of what I was talking about before. The fact that you have... Um, increased lifetime compared to direct excitons for indirect excitons means that you can get indirect excitons traveling over large distances. And the fact that they're oriented dipoles means that indirect exciton energy can be controlled via the applied gate voltage. And you can create potential profiles for excitons. And all of this together means you can create what's called excitonic devices. And so excitonic devices, we create these potential landscapes where the transport of excitons is controlled via the varying strength of electric field. 
and ideally these are single electrode devices, although some of them are multi-electrode devices. And so there's broadly speaking two categories of devices that we've constructed. There's exciton devices for basic study, so sort of basic science purposes. Um, things like artificial lattices as well as traps and stirring potentials, which are the two that I worked on substantially. Uh, and there's also excitonic circuit devices, which are more of an application-oriented type of thing. And so there we have excitonic transistors, which is something I worked on, as well as excitonic ramps, which are analogous to diodes, conveyors, which are analogous to CCDs, memory cells, integrated circuits, and several other devices, although this is all I've listed. But the ones I've worked on are traps, stirring potentials, and transistors. And so the transistor you see up in this upper right corner, it's kind of complicated how it works, but the flux of excitons is controlled via other exciton fluxes, and so you have excitonic gain. But all of these devices have a limitation, which is, remember I said, excitons are all bound together because opposite charges are attracted to each other. And they're bound together with some finite energy because they're a certain distance from one another, right? Even inside of a single quantum well, there's a finite distance between the electron and the hole. And there's a certain strength of attraction between the electron and the hole. So what will happen is thermal fluctuations, right? So just the random energy in atoms and molecules at any finite temperature other than absolute zero can actually destroy excitons because if the Boltzmann constant multiplied by the temperature and temperature in absolute units of Kelvin is greater than the exciton binding energy, the excitons will dissociate and you won't be able to operate any of these devices or even generate indirect excitons at all. And in the past, conventional structures that were based on gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide have operated up to 100 Kelvin, but that's thus far been the limit. And so there's been some interesting devices operating off of these asymmetric quantum wells that push the limits of conventional materials like gallium arsenide, including this excitonic sorry, exciton optoelectronic transistor, which is a hybrid electrical optical transistor. as well as this excitonic ramp, which is, again, built out of the conventional material, gallium arsenide. And we're able to control exciton transport. You see where this measure to exciton energy is decreasing, where it's the horizontal axis is showing position along this ramp device we see here. So you see excitons are going to want to move from the high energy region to the low energy region, right? Everything rolls downhill. And by turning on the electrode, we're able to create this shifted potential and move excitons. And by combining excitonic ramps, we're able to create the excitonic transistor I was mentioning where exciton transport is controlled via other excitons, which does require multiple optical excitations, but we're able to, you see, control where the output flux goes, where these two images on the left show the off state where there is no gate excitons, only source excitons, and then the two on states show how we can use either of these two arms, so this also functions as a switch to create a drain region by using small fluxes of excitons to turn the output on and off. And again, you can have either the uh, vertical output or the horizontal output, depending on where you put the gate beam. And so this shows some simulations of how we think that device operates, which I won't get into in too much detail, but we believe that it's via screening of disorder at this region in the, cent in the center, as well as via some thermal effects that inhibit recombination. And so, finally, I wanted to mention something that's a little bit of a tangent, but it's a very important one, which is in addition to all of these devices I've been talking about, 
Recall, I said several slides back that excitons are bosons and obey Bose-Einstein statistics, which means that they can undergo a process called Bose-Einstein condensation, which is of tremendous interest to us as physicists because it's a sort of exotic process where you can see very long-range quantum coherence. And this normally only occurs at temperatures of around 1 Kelvin in conventional gallium arsenide structures. But the potential maximum temperature for this in van der Waals structures is much higher. In fact, it could be as high as 100 Kelvin. And this data here is showing how we see very cold excitons in gallium arsenide structures via something called the external ring. And by doing interferometry experiments, we're able to show that there is spontaneous coherence, which is indicative of there being Bose-Einstein condensed excitons. And so this is all driven by something called the Bohr rate, by something called the excitonic Bohr radius, which for gallium arsenide is quite a bit larger than it is, or excuse me, quite a, yeah, quite a bit larger than it is for the TMD structures. So we believe we'll be able to ultimately get superfluidity at quite high temperatures of at least 100 Kelvin. And so recall, this is not just having stable excitons. This is having Bose-Einstein condensed excitons, because I said before, gallium arsenide could support excitons up to 100 Kelvin, but that's just having excitons that are stable, not that actually Bose-Einstein condense. And so this could have Bose-Einstein condensed excitons around 100 Kelvin. That's still a long ways off, but I'm going to show you over the rest of this presentation how we've managed to achieve stable excitons at high temperatures in van der Waals structures. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about a study we did on a van der Waals heterostructure where we were looking for indirect excitons and instead we found two other things called trions and our old friend direct excitons. So what a van der Waals heterostructure is, is it's two-dimensional sheets of material, excuse me, two-dimensional sheets of material that are held together within the sheet via covalent bonds but where the sheets are bonded to each other in three dimensions via van der Waals forces, which are much weaker. And so the most famous of these sort of material types is graphene, right? Graphene is a single layer held together by covalent bonds and then attached to some surface via van der Waals forces. And a van der Waals heterostructure involves multiple different materials held together. And so graphite is also an example of a would be an example of a van der Waals homostructure where there's multiple sheets of graphene bound to each other via van der Waals forces. But in recent years, there have been some fabrication techniques that have facilitated creation of these atomically thin structures, where we're able to attach whatever whatever two-dimensional sheets of material we can come up with. We what you know not literally anything, but any material that has the same structure as graphite can be pulled apart into graphene-like sheets and then put into put back together into these sandwiches of whatever materials we want. And so we're going to use that to create quantum wells, just like we did with gallium arsenide, right, where we want to create these types of potential profiles where there's local minima to the energy inside the quantum wells such that we can confine charge carriers, electrons and holes, into those regions. But instead of gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide, or aluminum gallium arsenide, now we're going to use materials like molybdenum disulfide and boron nitride. And so on the right you can see some, that's actually wafer dicing tape being used to create some van der Waals heterostructures uh, via Andre Geim's, Geim, sorry, Andre Geim's famous scotch tape fabrication technique, although we're not actually using scotch tape, but we are quite literally using tape, that's a uh, blue wafer dicing tape there. Uh, and so this is just that process being shown under a microscope where the different colors represent different layers. So, you know, like where you see the 
sort of pink region here and the yellow region there, those only different those are only different in their thickness by a single atom. And so something that's special about the material molybdenum disulfide, which I was showing you here, um, see this white and blue uh, layer here, that's what we're using to represent molybdenum disulfide is a semiconductor. So it has a band gap. And in particular, it's what's called a direct band gap semiconductor, which means that the band edges are aligned. And so what that means is that they're able to absorb and emit photons efficiently, uh, as opposed to indirect band gap semiconductors like silicon um, that can absorb photons, but that are extremely inefficient at emitting them. So MOS2 makes a very good optoelectronic material. And so we decided we would try to create a structure, or more accurately, ask Andre Geim to create a structure for us so that we could study indirect excitons in transition metal dichalcogenides, van der Waals heterostructures. And he was very kind and obliged, in part because my advisor and him were from the same little town in Siberia. And what they came up with was this, where we have a bulk substrate consisting of a silicon wafer with 70 nanometers of silicon dioxide on top of uh, all bulk materials. And then we have a layer of molybdenum disulfide on top of the silicon dioxide that acts as our first quantum well. And then we have boron nitride, which is an excellent, excellent insulator to serve as our barrier layer in the middle here. And then we have another layer of molybdenum disulfide that serves as our second quantum well. And then again, we have more boron nitride to serve as the encapsulating barrier over like on this side. And then finally, we actually use a sheet of graphene as our top electrode. And so this diagram here is showing the spatial alignment of all those different layers. And you can see there's uh, not a very large intersection where we have everything we need. There's kind of little bits where we have MOS2, but no graphene, and other places where we have graphene, but no boron nitride. And it's uh, only in this tiny little area that's inside the white circle where we really have everything that we need. Um, and again, so I just want to mention this is a still a symmetric heterostructure. I'll talk at the very end about these asymmetric heterostructures where uh, everything I'm going to be talking about until the end is all boron nitride barrier insulator layers with molybdenum disulfide quantum well layers. But there is also work on tungsten selenide molybdenum sulfide heterostructures where there's built-in electric fields, but no, this does not have any built-in electric field and an applied electric field using the graphene top gate is required, uh, although it also uses the silicon as the back gate, which creates some problems that I'll talk about in just a minute. So this is a simplified version of the optical setup that I used. So again, just broad strokes explaining what went on. There was a 404 nanometer laser diode, which is to excite far, 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 but far above resonance. So we weren't sure quite what we were going to be getting. We wanted to make sure we would be far off resonance and have plenty of energy in our laser photons. So it's a really short wavelength, high energy photon. And that laser diode is sent through a beam splitter and then through a microscope objective into our optical cryostat where it's used to excite uh, very carefully just this region in the center. Although we of course studied photoluminescence over the entire sample, but we're wanting to look at just that intersection where we have the quantum wells and the controlling electrode. And then it's passed back through the beam splitter and then this red light represents the photoluminescence signal coming back out after the laser excitation. And then that's passed into our spectrometer, into the CCD. So what did we see when doing these studies? Well, not quite what we'd hoped for. <laughs> um, we found th th at cryogenic temperatures, three emission lines. And so what we believe and are fairly confident those correspond to is one of the, is at least one of them is our direct exciton. So this is not the indirect exciton we want. This is a direct exciton, so it is a positive hole 
bound to a negative electron, but they are very close to each other, so they have very short lifetime and will quickly recombine and turn back into a photon before they can move around anywhere inside the sample. And there, because of the band structure of molybdenum disulfide, there's actually two different uh, types of electron with slightly different energies. And so those correspond to the two peaks we see at cryogenic temperatures. And the other thing we see is something called a trion. Uh, and this is because there's impurities and as well as some disorder potentially creating built-in electric fields in the sample. And so what this, the net effect of one of those things or the other is there is an excess of either electrons or holes. Uh, we think electrons, but we're not sure in the quantum well. And so that means that there's basically not enough, either not enough electrons for every hole or not enough holes for every electron. And so instead, the charge carriers are forming structures like this, where you'll see two holes bound to one electron or two electrons bound to one hole. And the like charges will still repel each other, but they're sufficiently attracted to the positive charge to form a bound state. And so we were able to see some sort of exciton at room temperature. So this is already looking somewhat promising, even though it didn't have the indirect excitons we were ultimately hoping for. And the relative intensity of the high energy exciton lines increases with temperature, which is consistent with the thermal dissociation of trions. Because as you can imagine, these trions are not as stable as excitons because there's only one dissimilar charge for every two two similar charges, their binding energy is going to be lower, so they're going to dissociate at a lower temperature. And by the time you get to room temperature, the trion line has completely disappeared. And in fact, there's only one exciton line that we can see because these two exciton types become indistinguishable. And so you can see this waterfall plot here of starting out at 1.6 Kelvin near absolute zero, going all the way up to 286 Kelvin, which is room temperature, start out with these three distinct emission lines, and at room temperature, there's only one. And on the right, we're just plotting the energy and intensity of those lines versus temperature. So you can see the energy going down and the intensity of the exciton line going up, and the intensity of the trion line going down. So there's one more thing I want to talk about which is there is also long spin lifetime in these materials. And that's essentially because of, again, the band structure of molybdenum disulfide. It turns out that there's essentially two band edges. Uh, one corresponds to spin up and the other corresponds to spin down, loosely speaking. And as a result of this, there's what we call uh, spin momentum locking. So if you excite a particular polarize with a particular polarization of light and therefore create a particular handedness of electron spin, it will not be able to change its spin without also changing its momentum, which would require a very statistically unlikely change and would have to encounter a phonon or something like that. And so if you excite near resonance, so near the band gap energy, with polarized light rather than unpolarized light, you will get the same polarization back out in the photoluminescence emission. Whereas if you excite with a very high energy laser that's very far from resonance, uh, there will be such an excess of energy that you will lose all polarization because, uh, like I said, this is created by the fact that if you, you cannot change spin without changing momentum, but if you have so much excess momentum that you're just doing everything at once all willy-nilly, then it really doesn't matter and you don't get any polarization in the emitted light. So this is showing power dependence, which is further evidence for trions. Um, again, starting out at low powers, you kind of see these three lines, although one of them's a little bit suppressed. And as you go to higher and higher powers, the in probability of trion formation actually goes up. And that's because as you sh shine more and more laser light on the material, you're just generating more and more carriers. And there is an excess of carriers still, but we think that just creating so many carriers that it makes trions more favorable. We're not quite sure, but we believe that's the 
reason for this effect. Okay, so now let me talk about the limitations of this particular part of my thesis research, which is where we tried to get indirect excitons in this particular material. So we failed, <laughs> and we failed because the sample blew up before we could apply a strong enough electric field. <laughs> so you see this plot here goes from negative 20 volts up to positive 40 volts. And the reason it stops after that is at positive 50 volts, the sample exploded. <laughs> so the fact that we were unable to observe indirect excitons at anything shy of 50 volts, though, reflects a flaw in the design of this sample. And so, like I was saying, trions form due to an excess of carriers. And so you can see that capacitatively, the number of carriers in each quantum well is going to change with the gate voltage because there's some non there's some non-zero leakage resistance and there's some non-zero capacitance of each quantum well. And at negative voltages, we're essentially sucking those carriers out. And so we're making it more like back to neutral. So now there is there is one electron for every hole, and all we see is the excitons. Whereas at positive voltages, we're sort of enhancing the effect of excess carriers. And we are creating more trions because we're making it even more infeasible to have one electron per hole because we're not sure, again, we're not sure, we think there's excess electrons even though it's negative voltages that suppress it, but remember it's this equation that governs that and this involves resistances and capacitances of the quantum wells. But so at positive voltages we're injecting excess carriers and that's making trions more likely. And this is reflected in this graph here where we are able to shift the energy of the emission lines by applying a gate voltage. So there is something going on that is vaguely indicative of trying to form an indirect exciton. And what's going on is we're shifting the energy of a direct exciton, with, which has a very shallow slope, but we would like to be able to shift the energy much more with an indirect exciton, and it ain't happening because this structure it just blows up when you apply the amount of voltage you would need. And so why is this creating such a problem? Well, I have to go back to find a blown it out graph. Well, remember I was talking about this 70 nanometers of silicon dioxide. So when you have a structure like this that's only single atoms thick, uh, even 70 nanometers is actually huge, right? This whole structure here is, you know, maybe at most 50 nanometers thick. Um, and so 70 nanometers is actually, you know, quite a lot on top of that. And so the quantum wells don't care how much voltage there is. They care how strong the electric field is. And the strength of the electric field is voltage divided by distance. So if you have this huge 70 nanometer distance being added to the total thickness, then, you know, that's reducing the overall strength of the electric field to the point where that E field just is not strong enough to get us to the point where indirect excitons are favorable. And before we could, and we can just brute force that, right? We just apply, you know, okay, say, okay, you know, we have weaker electric field for the same voltage. Let's just crank up the voltage. Well, we tried that and the sample blew up, but we didn't try that until we took all this other data. So we're still able to publish a paper on all of this, which was in applied physics letters. And so this was trions and direct excitons in van der Waals heterostructure, where we observed three emission lines, one corresponding to trions, the, the other two corresponding to direct excitons. And the dependence of these lines on the various controllable parameters, most mostly the gate voltage, indicate that we were looking at precisely that, but also that we needed to do better. So how do we do better? Well, we went back and we talked to our sample fabricator, uh, and I ultimately went to actually go visit their lab, which was pretty neat. And we came up with a new sample design, which was to replace the silicon dioxide with just a few layers, five nanometers worth, 
of boron nitride. And to replace the, excuse me, bottom conductive electrode with graph, bulk graphite. So not graphene, but graphite is this gray slab here. And again, the top gate is still, is still graphene. And everything else is essentially the same, except a bit thinner. We've got thin boron nitride as our insulating layers. Molyb molybdenum disulfide is still s serving as our quantum well layer. But again, we no longer have that thick 70 nanometers of silicon dioxide insulator. We instead have 5 nanometers of boron nitride. And so we also got a little bit, little bit larger sample area from them this time. Uh, in this little region in here. And this sample worked a lot better. We can support much higher electric fields without having the sample break down and explode. <laughs> but we're looking for the same thing here. We want indirect excitons, this green oval, with electron in one quantum well, hole in the other quantum well, rather than direct, like this blue oval, where they're in the same quantum well, and they just recombine with each other right away. We want them to have a happy exciton life before they die and turn back into a photon. So this time things were a little bit different because we were able to study indirect excitons. That means we're starting to look at their lifetime because the lifetimes in the previous experiment were extremely short, right? This simple setup has no time dependence because everything was less than a picosecond in duration. So there's no point. We just did spectroscopy and microscopy. But in this experiment, it's more complicated where we're still exciting with a laser and we're still sending that light into a spectrometer. But now we're using a photomultiplier and in some cases a gated intensifier to look at things as a function of time. And so you can see there's a few different situations we do. One is we we pulse the laser on and off, and the other is we just leave the laser on. So leaving the laser on, we can get just regular spectra, but by pulsing the laser on and off, and then doing what we call integration windows, where we look at the photoluminescence while the laser is off, we can look for different emission spectra. And so we're using pulse generator to drive the laser, and sending that same pulse from the pulse generator to a time-correlated photon counting system, and that system can compare the output from this photomultiplier tube to the pulse it gets from the pulse generator driving the laser, and determine when to look for photo emissions, and then the results are sent to a computer for counting and integration. And so what we get looks like this, is if you just leave the laser on all the time and take a regular spectrum, you see this sort of magenta peak here, which corresponds to direct excitons. And if you do a integration window that only looks while the laser is off, then you get this green peak here, which we believe are indirect excitons. And finally, if you look at this blue window that include, is mostly when the laser is off, but includes a little bit of when the laser is on, then you get both. And again, you see on this diagram, the red is when the laser is on and the gaps are when it's off. So we have a rep rate of 40 nanoseconds and a duty cycle of 25%. So it's 10 nanoseconds with the laser on, 30 nanoseconds with the laser off, and we're looking during that 30 nanosecond window when it's off. And so then to confirm, we went and looked at the emissions explicitly as a function of time, but inside of a particular spectral window. So looking at just these wavelengths here, we wanted to see what we would get. Uh, or sorry, we, you know, we, we have different windows for different things. So if we look, if we look in this window here around 1.5 electron volts, we get the green curve. And if we look at the value over here around 1.8 to 1.9 electron volts, we get the magenta curve here. So colors are the same between the two plots. And 
what we find is that the direct excitons more or less follow the laser, where they shut off very quick, right? The laser shuts off, and then very, very quickly, the emissions from the direct excitons disappear. But the indirect excitons are persisting for several nanoseconds after the laser is off. And so you can see, then, like I said, we want to be able to control things via voltage. So we were able to control this lifetime via the applied gate voltage from uh, both at room temperature and cryogenic temperatures, actually. And we were able to adjust it from about 15 to about 10 nanoseconds, which is orders of magnitude greater than the, the direct excitons here have a lifetime of like two picoseconds, right? It's just shut, you know, this curve is just going down as fast as the laser can possibly shut off. So as soon as the laser shuts off, we stop, stop seeing direct excitons, so they don't have any appreciable lifetime. Okay, so then finally I want to talk about the control of the indirect exciton, indirect exciton energy, and especially at room temperature, because remember, the whole reason we wanted to go to these TMD heterostructures is because they offer better performance at room temperature, right? Gallium arsenide structures are great, but they don't work at anything other than cryogenic temperatures. So to help fix that, we went to TMD structures, and we wanted to make sure that they actually worked at room temperature, which the previous structure didn't really work at all, but this structure works great and it works at room temperature. So this is data taken at 300 Kelvin, so roughly room temperature. And what we see is an emission line that can be shifted more or less linearly as we apply a gate voltage. Uh, and it can be shifted quite a bit more at cryogenic temperatures than at room temperature because we're scaredy cats and we didn't want to apply too strong a voltage, especially after blowing up the last sample. But we can shift it over uh, 50 MeV, or sorry, we can skif shift it over about 100 MeV at low temperatures, and we can shift it over about 50 MeV at, even at room temperature. So this is actually starting to be reasonably effective uh, because 100 MeV is actually, or sorry, 50 MeV actually corresponds roughly to the thermal energy of particles moving at room temperature. So this could potentially already be adequate to produce room temperature excitonic devices. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about exciton transport. So this is showing the spatial profile. So this is no longer a spectrum. This is showing position in micrometers. And what we see is that there's not a whole lot of exciton diffusion away from the excitation spot, but there is a little bit. So their lifetime is long enough to diffuse, but the samples are still highly disordered. So remember I said excitons can screen disorder to facilitate transport. Um, they're not facilitating a whole lot of transport in this material just yet, but we believe in the future they'll be able to, and there's now ongoing work uh, in the Butov group at UCSD where I got my PhD, where they are actually producing new samples that are creating uh, increasingly long-range transport of indirect excitons. So you can see the black curve shows when the laser is off, where we're looking only at indirect excitons, and the red curve is showing when it's on, and we're looking at direct excitons. So indirect excitons are spread out more than direct excitons, which is indicative of at least a little bit of transport, although not very much. And so, conclusion, indirect excitons were observed at room temperature in van der Waals molybdenum disulfide boron nitride heterostructures, and those indirect excitons have long lifetimes, orders of magnitude longer than lifetimes of direct excitons in single layer molybdenum disulfide, and their energy is controlled by gate voltage at room temperature, which is critical. Remember, the fact that we have controllable energy at room temperature was the whole reason that we wanted to move to these molybdenum disulfide structures instead of gallium arsenide. And so here is a list of my publications, including the, uh, well, not so recent anymore publication from 2020 that I mentioned that was the ongoing work to get a longer range transport. And here are my conference presentations from graduate school. And finally, here's quickly the supplementary materials I wanted to mention where we were moving to this other type of structure where we have 
asymmetric materials used in the two quantum wells where there's now a built-in electric field. So now there will be indirect excitons even when the gate voltage is zero. And so there were some promising results that I was working on when I graduated, which were subsequently published and are in the journal Nano Letters. So take a look at that if y'all would like to. And yeah, that's the end of the slideshow. So since this is being recorded rather than given live to an audience, I will have to ask you to post any questions you have to the comments section, but I'd be happy to answer them if anybody is wandering across this and would like to know. Thank you so much for your time. Again, I am Erica Kalman. I got my PhD in Leonid Butov's group at University of California, San Diego Physics Department in transition metal dichalcogenide van der Waals heterostructures and studying indirect excitons in them. Yeah. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye.